This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the life of David in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 3. Now before we begin our prayer, let me remind you of a few things. First of all, on the cover sheet you see the email. If you want to write me about a particular lesson or maybe some spiritual issue you're having, I'll be glad to answer it and I'll try to get to it promptly. I usually do. Now the other thing I want us to look at is why do I remind you to be controlled by the Spirit? 1 Corinthians 2.12 reads, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit, capital S, who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we speak about these things not with words taught us by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual things people, that is, people who have the Spirit. Now, all believers have the Holy Spirit. However, as a believer, we have to be controlled by the Spirit, not by our sinful nature, that which rules the natural man. So when we hear the Word of God, and we really want to learn it, and we grow, we must give ourselves over to the Spirit. This is a deliberate choice, an act that we have to make and I think many Christians don't understand that. But you are a spiritual being because your human spirit has been activated by God because you have a relationship with God. And so he can communicate through his spirit to your spirit. Your spirit is uh, animated. It's, in, it's enlivened so that you can connect with God and he can communicate to you. But you have to have your spiritual lines open. So that's why I remind you every lesson to do that. Now, many believers will spend much of their li lifetime without their spiritual lines open, and they have no idea what I'm talking about because they don't do it. But once you get into the habit of doing this, just like confessing your sins, you'll find yourself growing. You'll find an interest in the Word. You'll find a deeper understanding. You'll see insight. Your application will come much easier. And you'll actually enjoy some of the most difficult lessons that I have to offer. Because it's beyond the academic realm. It's in the spiritual realm. These words are from God, the Holy Spirit, that are designed to go into your spirit, activated by God. At the same time, it's enhanced by God's own Holy Spirit. So this is always a very important process. It's not something to be taken lightly, but deliberately. So, prepare ourselves for the Word of God. Let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins. At the same time, we're giving ourselves over to the Spirit for His control. Let's pray. And I'm most gracious, Heavenly Father. We thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and all that you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open. In Jesus' name, amen. This is allergy season again, which is almost year-round down here in Texas. But especially bad after we've had some rain and I just have a hard time breathing. You'll probably hear me out of breath. That's because I'm trying to talk with... Uh, being stopped up for the most part and trying to talk and breathe all the time is difficult uh, when you have to do both of your mouth so anyway in our last lesson we began chapter six david mustered thirty thousand elite soldiers to escort the ark of the lord to jerusalem from a place called baale yoda formerly called kiroth jarim and bring it back to Jerusalem. Now in our story, the place is still called Kiroth Jarim. Let me show you a map of where we're going. Kiroth Jarim is just about in the center here. I'll highlight it. And they're gonna take it over to Jerusalem. So it's not far away, but you do see some of the hills if you look at the terrain here. You have to go up and down. Of course, there were trails in between the higher mountains, but uh, this is a the route they're gonna go. Now, upon the ark was the mercy seat. It's a very sacred object. It was the mercy seat over which the Lord was 
to be enthroned when he was present among the people of Israel. Now, again, this is the most sacred piece of furniture in the tabernacle. God had given instructions, specific instructions, through the law of how it was to be transport, uh, transported. It was supposed to be just carried on the shoulders by the Kohathite Levites. They would carry these poles, which would go through the rings on the ark, lifting it, of course, up off the ground. So it would be you know, a foot or so off the ground. Let's go to the law on this. Just a couple of references. These refer to it kind of an indirect way. But let me look at Numbers 4.15 and 7.9 with you. Numbers 4.15 and 7.9. goes back to the time of Moses. Here we see Aaron mentioned. After Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings, of course now they're all priests, and all the holy articles, when the camp is ready to move, only then are the Kohathites to come and to do the carrying. But they must not touch the holy things or they will die. That's why they had the ark on poles. The Kohathites are to carry those things that are in the tent of meeting. Verse 9, But Moses did not give any to the Kohathites, talking about something else, because they were to carry on their shoulders the holy things for which they were responsible. And you go back and read that in detail if you want. But the point is, it's supposed to be carried by the Kohathite Levites. For some reason, we're going to see that David had, does not have it transported that way. Uh, he is trying to get things organized, but we'll see him do that a lot more after something like this. I think that's one reason you have this big pause of time in between. But he had neglected looking into how to properly carry this, or the Levites didn't step up. Something went wrong here in the communication. Could be they're so... Uh, happy about it they don't give it much thought about how it, be, how it was to be done sometimes that happens it slips by but this is just too important to miss as they will find out so what they're going to do they're going to transport the cart or excuse me the ark on a cart not the way it's to be done that's first three second um, samuel six three and they loaded the ark of the of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart. Now the hill may have been part of the problem, trying to take it down a hill, uh, uh, pulling a cart with oxen and not letting it slide off. We'll learn about the oxen in a moment. So Uzzah and Ahio were the sons of Abinadab, Abinadab, whose house it had been in for all those years, they were guiding the cart. They probably grew up with that uh, with the ark in their house. Now let's look at verses 4 and 5. There's a lot here, actually, but uh, we're going to look at both verses at the same time. Verse 4. They brought it, that is the cart, with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab on the hill. Ohio was walking in front of the ark. While David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with various musical instruments, literally with the all woods of fir, and lyres and harps and tambourines and systems and cymbals. So let's look at some of these phrases. Just to smooth it out, you'll see some conflict in your uh, different translations. It says various musical instruments. Well, literally, the Hebrew Masoretic text says, with all woods of fir, and some say that's a, just a general reference to some of these instruments. Otherwise, we don't really know what it means and lyres, and harps, and tambourines, and sistrums. What's a sistrum? You probably never heard of a sistrum. Well, let's put it on the board. I'll just show it to you in the Hebrew. It's the only time it's used in the entire scripture. Sistrum. The Hebrew is pronounced mana'ayim. And this is a translation of the words... Uh, Manahim, that they think is referring to a sistrum. This is what the Hebrew scholars have researched, and several come up with this. Some will have other translations, or maybe just leaving the word sistrum. That's what I do. But basically, what that is, it's an ancient um, 
musical instrument. It's actually, uh, well, let me just try to draw it a little bit. It's simple to draw, so I can probably pull this off. It has, like this, a wooden handle, and it would have a metal ring like that. And uh, these, this, this right here is about this wide, comparably to this, pic to this picture. So what they would do, they'd stick through metal rings, a drill hole sticks through these uh, metal holes I meant, pieces of metal, and they would cover them at the end so they wouldn't slide out. And then there was some space in the hole right here, okay, right here, and the metal pole would go through it, and when they shook it, it made this rattling sound. It reminds me of the uh, Latin instrument, the maraca. Of course, that's a gourd, right? But it looks kind of like the same thing, and it has beans in it, dried beans in it. Well, this is a metal shaker. So we're just ch -ch 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 -ch, okay. Percussion instrument. Percussion helps keep the, the rhythm, the beat. It's hard to have music without a beat. In fact, mu uh, music is often noted the style by its particular beat, if you know something about music. Well, anyway, that was the system. Now, let's go back to our verse that I'm talking about now, the one about the musical instruments. I'll put it back on the board. It says here they were celebrating. The Chronicles parallel over in 1 Chronicles 13 says they were doing this with all strength and all songs. So it's a very exuberant, energetic type of activity going on while they're starting to transport the ark to Jerusalem. <clears throat> So while they're guiding this new cart down the hill with the ark, the Israelites probably down towards the bottom of the hill with all these different instruments, singing, dancing, celebrating, rejoicing. After all, it's been more than 50 years since this ark has got this much attention. And imagine what we've studied about the ark, how important this really is. The most sacred object of worship is being taken to the political capital of all Israel, Jerusalem. Now this type of activity was not actually um, unusual in the ancient Near East. Other nations, anytime they would introduce their national god into a new royal city, they too would have a big celebration. So this is in line with ancient Near Eastern customs. But of course, Israel was always a different category because it was the one true god. But as we saw towards the beginning of our lesson, David is not having this transported correctly. They are, cele they are celebrating, which is fine and proper, but they are mishandling the ark. Far better for them to be very deliberate and solemn with the ark by following the law, transporting it correctly, than doing what they're doing now and still celebrating. Now, it should, it's true, they should be happy about it, having the ark back. But they needed to do this right, and they weren't. Now, whose fault it was, it doesn't say. One would probably have to blame David since he was in charge. But the Levites should have stepped up and done something about it, or stopped it, or warned David, or something. But they're transporting it wrong, and it will cost them. So here they go, pulling this cart with oxen, guided by the two sons, Uzzah and Ahio. They're going to bring it down to a threshing floor. Threshing floor was often a place of some sort of sacred activity. It was probably a large level-like floor, sort of a clearing, you might say. Verse 6, And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out to the ark of God and took hold of it because the oxen stumbled. So it probably started to slide. He wanted to prevent it from getting damaged. The threshing floor was known to be a place of some sort of sacred act, like building an altar. 2 Samuel 24, 16, 18, 21, 24 through 25. And though Uzzah reaching out to take hold of the ark may have been instinctive, that I might, with good intentions, he was not supposed to touch it, and it cost him his life. The parallel in 1 Chronicles 13, 10 says, 
He died because he had put his hand on the ark. Now, as mentioned earlier, only the Kohathite Levites were to transport it, and then they were to carry it by those poles on their shoulders. Now, were the poles still in it? Perhaps so. It was a, The poles were supposed to be kept in it for that very purpose, so you weren't going to touch it. Verse 7, And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. It's not said exactly how he died, other than the Lord struck him right there because of this error, as I translate it. It's basically something that was uh, an irreverent act, a very serious irreverent act. Now, the reason for carrying it on the uh, through the rings of the poles was to avoid needing to touch it. It's puzzling how they loaded it. They probably loaded it with the poles if they had it on there. Otherwise, how would they put it on there? So the poles probably were with it. At any rate, he died right there, beside the very ark he was trying to keep from falling, perhaps doing it some serious damage. After all, it was more than 400 years old. God is very serious about his rules on things like this. We've learned from other passages, different individuals violated a law that was set out or what was expected, Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, Achan, Joshua 7, Ananias and Sapphira, we studied them in our Acts series, chapter 5, 1 through 11, all of whom violated the Lord's rule. Now this may seem like very harsh judgment for such an infraction, but it's more than just that. Now don't expect to be able to explain this to an unbeliever. In fact, it's difficult sometimes, I think, for believers to understand it because we don't comprehend easily the fact that God had holy things. Holy in the realm of God's standard as things that are perfect, sinless. Uh, the word itself means set apart. We ourselves as Christians have been set apart to God as his own property. We're commanded to live holy lives, though we don't do a good job at it in large part. But we're supposed to be growing in our holiness. They call that sanctification. Progressive sanctification is a more theological technical term. And we do that by learning the word, being controlled with the spirit, and basically perfecting our lives in line with who Christ was and God's standard. There was no more sacred object than the ark. Um, as far as I know, you could touch about everything else except the ark. Of course, you still had to follow the other rules, but this ark was not even supposed to be touched. I've already seen others die because they decided to look in it. And for that, it brought death because they touched the ark. It was not supposed to be touched. David reacts to what he experiences here with the death of Uzzah. Verse 8. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Paraz Uzzah to this day. Uh, Paratz means basically break out. Same word we saw for the Lord breaking out against the Philistines as floodwaters. Do you remember that? He broke out. It's like he comes forth quickly, sometimes violently, to punish or discipline someone. God has struck Uzzah down. At the end of the verse, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. In other words, the place of outbreak against Uzzah. Now, David's anger may have been understandable uh, by many. But what we need to remember is God's holy standard. That's why I talked about that a moment ago. It must be kept. To violate God's holy standard, which is basically his law on certain things like we have here, Without punishment would mean that God is not 
utilizing his justice or that he didn't make this holy or we're not to take it seriously. Couldn't be more serious. There are certain things believers cannot do no matter how well intentioned. God's holiness takes precedence. Those two major things we should remember about the ark here, and this is the lesson to support one of them. Earlier we saw it's the place of the presence of God. The ark is. Once it gets in place and the spirit moves in, God moves back in, it's a place of his presence. The second thing we should have just learned, that it is holy. It's set apart to God. This is part of his ownership. It belongs to him and is to be totally respected in that. Some of us sometimes, and this is a very small comparison, but we have something we is very precious to us. We don't like people touching it or maybe sometimes even seeing it. Well, this is much more than that. This is God's seat. Human hands don't touch it. It's a holy place. Remember Moses not to step on the holy ground in the presence of the burning bush. This is a holy place. No man is qualified to touch it. Well, the death of Uzzah had another effect on David besides being angry. That's a reaction. And like I said, some can understand it, but you've got to understand the holiness of God. Verse 9. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? David's got a problem. David is beginning to realize just how holy the ark is and how the high standards of God are regarding it. A part of fearing God is understanding his holiness. It's like, oh, then you back away. Fear, you back away. You don't touch it. Don't go near it. You stick your arms out and no one else goes near it. God expects holiness in us. But also those things in regards to him, like this ark. And it demands nothing less than perfect obedience. The ark belongs to the Lord. As the place of his presence, his throne on earth, it must be treated precisely as the Lord instructed. Now, I've said that several times. So David has a problem. Let me just get the verse back up there. Here's the question. How can the ark of the Lord come to me? How can he transport it? How can he get it over there? Well, he had to go back to the instruction manual. So somewhere along the line, he goes back to the law. Now, we'll get to that in a few minutes. But David is going to have to put it somewhere until he figures out how he's going to move it. Verse 10. This in itself, this verse in itself has some interesting uh, side studies. So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Somehow he got over to Obed's house without any more uh, incidents. After the death of Uzzah and David's anger over it, David decides to put off taking the ark on into Jerusalem, and he takes it to this house of a man by the name of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. David's not ready to take it into the city. In fact, the city's probably not even ready for it. They've got to, how do I put this, get things cleaned up. Now, that's a very general term for saying we got to get preparations for the proper care, place, and everything surrounding the ark and start treating it like it's supposed to. Let's get the standards back right away. Now, here's something I think everyone can relate to. Oh, I can relate to it regarding physical shape, what, what kind of physical shape you keep yourself in, your habits and working out or, or exercise. There's all sorts of parallels here. But the problem is, they weren't ready mentally, spiritually, or even physically for this ark. And they had to get things prepared. They weren't. In fact, they weren't even close. And it's going to take them a while to get everything properly prepared. In fact, it's going to take about three months. 
Let's talk about this man by the name of Obed Edom the Gittite. I did some research on his name. There's some issues here with his name that are certainly raised when you just read it. First of all, Edom. Edom's another country, or Edom is something else, but the name Obed means servant, so he's a servant of Edom. Well, you look up the research, Edom's the name of a foreign god or tribe. But in this case, I think it's just a name. We don't know its derivative or its origin, who it came from. It just has it in common with this god or tribe. He's also called a Gittite. Now, what's a Gittite? Well, normally in that area, it's a resident of Gath. Gath, we've seen many times, it's a major Philistine city, home of Goliath. We were just there not long ago with the ark. And they moved it out of there quickly. Now, we could never imagine him being a Philistine in such a position like this. So who is he when it talks about him being a Gittite? Well, let's first of all understand what he is. If we go to 1 Chronicles 26.1, compare it with 26.6, we find out that he is a Korahite Levite. The very type of Levite, I should say, from the clan who has been designated to carry the ark. David will not entrust the ark to a Philistine, so he's not named a Gittite for that reason. So what does Gittite mean? Well, there's a couple of ideas on this one. The word also may be related to the word gat. Let me just write it up there. Gat. G-A-T. Gat is the usual word for wine press. So it could mean they had something to do with a wine press or maybe a city that had wine presses in it. The word gitam, gityam, uh, means two wine presses. And gittite may be a form of that. But no question from the scripture itself, it tells us he is a Levite, uh, the priestly tribe of Israel. Now, why would David place the ark in this man's house? Probably because he was a Korahite Levite and it would be safe around him because he would know how to handle it. Later on, uh, we'll see him assigned to be a gatekeeper of the ark by David when he starts making assignments with the Levites. We'll get to that. Uh, that's in 1 Chronicles 15.24, by the way, and 16.38, so you have to go to the cross-references on that. And that meant that he was to guard the ark from any unauthorized access, an important position. Well, for now, while it's at his house, he is responsible to watch over it in his own home. So he didn't have to go far to work, you might say. Verse 11. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. This is an interesting verse as well. Now remember the effect the presence had, the presence of the ark had on the cities in Philistia uh, with the, the tumors, people going into panic and afraid to have it in their own town. Quite the opposite effect here. There's blessing now instead of cursing. And the three months that the ark was in his house, it says, the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. The Lord is pleased with his ark being in Israel and with Obed-Edom and among his household. Obed-Edom and his household must have treated the ark with great respect, watching over it, watching over it carefully, dutifully. For that, the Lord has blessed them. As often is the case in the Old Testament, Blessing came to people through various ways. It appears that one of the ways in which Obed-Edom was blessed is through a large family. It says that he had uh, eight sons, 1 Chronicles 26, 4 through 8. Let's go to 1 Chronicles for a moment. Let's look at 1 Chronicles 26, 8, just regarding Obed-Edom. And these were descendants of Obed-Edom, 
They and their sons and their relatives were capable men with the strength to do the work. Descendants of Obed-Edom, Edom, 62 in all. What a Thanksgiving dinner they had, huh? By leaving the ark at Obed-Edom's house, David had time to find out what went wrong, and they're trying to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. He was going to make sure he finds out what went wrong. Why did the Lord strike Uzzah down, resulting in David getting so angry with the Lord? David was missing something from what he should know and what he should have done. Verse 12, 2 Samuel 6, 12. And it was told King David, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed, Edom, and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Now this is at least after three months of it being there. Now notice that it's not just a family that was blessed, but all that belongs to him. What else does that include? It doesn't tell us. But the blessing would indicate that it was now safe to bring it on up to Jerusalem. I think that's the way David must have read it. The Lord's not angry. You know, the Lord never is angry for very long. Um, his anger is not so much driven by emotion like ours, but driven by his character, his justice needing to be satisfied, and that type of thing. Well, when David heard about it, he wanted the ark moved on into Jerusalem, but only after he figured out what went wrong and how to correct it. Now, as I have said, the parallel passage, in other words, the other account of this historical events, these historical events are in the Chronicles. And they will give some details sometimes we don't get in Samuel. This is probably one of the biggest ones we have that we would like to see more detail in to understand what went wrong, what David's doing. And it helps us quite a bit. So we're going to do a detour. We're going to go over to 1 Chronicles 15, which is the parallel account of 2 Samuel here, of what happens next. And we're going to look at some select verses because some of it's just a list of names. And you can go read those if you want, but I don't want to spend the time on that, though it's important. Uh, not to our study at this point. Now, let's go to 1 Chronicles 15, 1. We're going to spend much of the rest of our lesson on 1 Chronicles in that book. 1 Chronicles 15, 1. After David had constructed buildings for himself in the city of David, he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Now, we saw earlier that he prepared the city in 2 Samuel. Now, I think Chronicles helps us with the order a little bit better, but the point is he's now got the city ready and he's got a tent ready for the ark. The tent would provide a central place of worship in the political capital, Jerusalem. With all the construction was going on, remember he's expanding the city. <clears throat> he had the carpenters come in, the stonemasons come in, built the palace. The ark gets a tent, just a tent. That will become an issue later. David realizes that. And you can probably just put pieces together and think, well, David has not got instructions about where to put the ark yet specifically, other than it's okay to put it in Jerusalem, in this tent. The old mosaic tabernacle is still back at Gibeon. That's in um, 1 Chronicles 16, 19. Well, here the ark has its own tent. Now, we're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at verse 2. We're getting more detail. Verse 2. Then David said, No one but the Levites may carry the ark of God, because the Lord chose them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister before him forever. Now, this is right out of the Mosaic Law. 
So David has probably went back to the book. Maybe his own copy. Remember, he's supposed to make a copy. Deuteronomy 10.8. That would be the, one of the points of references. We continue in 1 Corinthians 15.3. We're getting more detail. David assembled all Israel and Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. So now he's got a place prepared for it in Jerusalem. Verse 4, he called together the descendants of Aaron and the Levites. From the descendants of Kohath, this would be the Kohathites, Uriah the leader, and 120 relatives. Now, from here for about the next five verses, he makes list of these people. There's hundreds of them. But he is bringing up the priest so he can bring the ark in properly. And he begins to assign duties to different Levite clans. The first mentioned here, I just showed you, is the descendants of Kohath. From verses 5 through 12, he lists and numbers including the numbers of the family or clan leaders and their relatives. And there's hundreds of them, as I just said. He's making a lot of preparations that we don't see in 2 Samuel. Now, the reason I brought you over here, you can probably see it, seems self-evident, that uh, David is really going all out now on preparations. You know, the priest should be involved in here. Then he kind of brings them in, even signs them duties of what they're supposed to do. Let's pick it up again in verse 11 and 12. Then David summoned Zadok and Abiathar, the priest, and Uriel, Asaiah, Joel, Shema'anah, Eliel, and Aminadab, the Levites. And he said to them, You are the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I prepared for it. Now that's getting specific. I guess it took a lesson like the loss of Uriah for David to realize he needs to do this right. People need to see that it was treated with the proper respect of God's mercy seat, the ark of the covenant, the ark of God. Verse 13, David mentions where they failed in first moving the ark, leading it up, leading to the death of Uzzah. Verse 13, it was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. So David's taking blame too. We did not inquire. The Levites weren't involved. As I said, it seems from what I gather here that any of the Levites could have spoken up and reminded David of what they're doing if they knew what he was doing. Verse 14, so the priests and Levites consecrated themselves in order to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Israelites carried, excuse me, and the Levites carried the ark of God with the poles on their shoulders as Moses had commanded in accordance with the word of the Lord. Now, as we go on through this particular passage in 1 Chronicles, there's another long list of the Levites and their assigned duties. Some would be singers, others play musical instruments. That is, they're to make a joyful sound with musical instruments, lyres, harps, and cymbals. Some, including our Obed-Edom, who we know now, will be assigned to be a gatekeeper for the ark. I guess he's proven himself. Let's pick it up at verse 25 and 26, still in 1 Chronicles. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of units of, of a thousand went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. Verse 26, because God had helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, seven bulls and seven rams were sacrificed. So here we see seven bulls and seven rams sacrificed. Now, at this point, we can go back to our 2 Samuel, pick it up in verse 13. 2 Samuel 6, 13, pick it up where we left off. So now David has everything and everybody in place to move the ark properly to its tent in Jerusalem. 
David's going to do some other things here. Verse 13. Now this is back to 2 Samuel 6, 13. And when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. After only six steps of carrying the ark, perhaps they just got it outside the house, he sacrificed uh, an ox and a fattened animal. Notice it says he, this would have been the Levites, but this, putting it this way emphasized that uh, David was involved in the sacrifice. Now, oxen and bulls were often sacrificed as burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Okay, Leviticus 1, 4 through 6, 4, 10, 9, 4, and verse 18. We see three big changes here from the first attempt of transporting the ark. They're now carrying it correctly with the right people. They offer sacrifices. The third thing, David is dressed in a linen ephod. The linen ephod is usually associated with the priest, but occasionally during the time of the kings, the monarchy, the king would officiate as a priest in a special function like this one, the bringing up of the ark into Jerusalem. Another time we see it, the dedication of the altar or sanctuary, uh, some of the great annual festivals, 2 Chronicles 24, 25, 1 Kings 8, 64, and 9, 25. Usually this part of the worship be left up to a priest, 2 Kings 16, 15. And the king was not a priest. One of the unique things about our Lord Jesus is that he has both the offices of king and priest. Well, after this sacrifice, it appears they continue right on into the city of Jerusalem. Now in our next lesson, Michael, one of David's wife is going to, wives is going to get perturbed with dancing David. And that's where we'll begin next time. Let's pray. Well, Father, again, we thank you for this word from you today. We ask that you'll challenge us with what we've heard, how important it is to be obedient, especially in those things where you require obedience specifically. Challenge us with these things. In Jesus' name, amen.